Again, any questions, any thoughts, any concerns, anything? Okay, one, two, three, anyone? Okay, we're going then. Okay, so uh, looking at your booklets, picking up your booklets for a second, I just want you to understand mm -hmm. something. That, uh, and you don't even actually have to open it, I just want you to get a kinesthetic for a moment. That in your booklet, uh, I, I, I once had a page number here, I don't even know what I did with it. But in your booklet, I talk to you about there's five different kinds of feedback that you can get from these cards. Okay? Uh, one is clues for learning, that you can take that in. One is to say, you know, which is in other words, what or how is going, you know, what's going on, how do I deal with it? Another one is, a, is asking about the attitude of the theme. Remember what I said about detecting what was present? Okay? So that, that's a possibility. Another one is to be proactive. It says, well, how can I look at this in a better or more productive or clarifying way? That would be your point of view to adopt, where you're asking for something proactive to kind of give you a suggestion. Now, this is the one that, of course, is where we all really, uh, you know, can have interesting responses. When we literally ask, what do I do? A call to action. And the cards will give you some of that feedback. And then lastly, and this, by the way, is where you use the cards divinationally or as far as projected, you know, psychic uh, possibilities. And that is to say, what's going to happen if? That is when you use these words, as a div uh, this cards, as a divination tool. All right. Divination oh. is another way of saying channeling. Divination is any form of using a, uh, a psychic medium uh, or a um, spiritual medium to ask about some kind of events in the future. Okay. Uh, it's the present, though. No, it could be about, well, about the present, of course, too. Yes, about the, that's true as well. Trying to get some other design. information designed that isn't necessarily obvious. It's also they're also referred to as oracles. Channeling would be one form of an oracle. Okay. Great. So, and by the way, so this list is on page 11, so I did have it, I'll just have to put it on top. Um, once again, um, this, uh, I want to answer a question that was brought up uh, just a moment ago by, who was it? Who had the, ah, there it is, okay, I was wondering, I couldn't remember, thank you, Shima. All right, so Shima said, I didn't recognize some of the symbols on the card she had, and she had card 57. Okay, right here, self-love. Now, what I want you to notice is, for those of you who know the Michael teaching, you'll notice that this group here, all the way over and all the way up, this is what's known as the overly set. This is the, the traditional matrix of personality energy that most everyone's familiar with, okay, from here up. These three group, groupings down here, the augments, the covenants, and then the cycle or soul age sets, I created... Because in, in tailoring this, this material to cards, I needed to give them some uh, similar characteristics. So self-love is, uh, augments are what I call the elements or aspects of personality that we have that aren't directly overleaves. They're more like energies that we add on around us. As far as when we come into a, a lifetime, we may take these as our, our structures, but we take some of these as some of our garments, so to speak, or some of the coloration of how we're going to uh, do our things. That's what I'm calling um, augments. The covenant cards, you notice they're gray, and you notice the five words there, karma, self-karma, life task, essence, twin, and maya. Those represent layers or elements about agreements and about what you are here to, to either do, work on yourself, and in the case of um, uh, Essence Twin, actually maybe have another person who you are in your most close agreement and commitment in, which is that paired other soul. That's what that means in this teaching. In the card, when you get an Essence Twin card, or the soulmate, or the lover's card, because in the same way last night I mentioned that um, the cycle off card is this deck's uh, equivalent of the death card of the tarot, meaning major transitions. The essence twin card in this deck would be the equivalent of the lovers in traditional tarot. 
So I'm giving you that extra information so you can kind of bring that in. In any case, all I wanted to point out in these three is, um, to some extent, in your booklets, but definitely explored in uh, the On Motivation book, <laughs> if I ever get it done, um, we'll talk about the significance of these in more detail. But currently, all of the responses in your booklet underneath these three, underneath these three groups will um, uh, shed light on each of the concepts on their own. And again, the reason I made this chart, you can see relationships via color. And in terms of co covenants, I want you to understand the reason I chose gray is how many of you have heard the, 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 the uh, statement that things are seldom black or white, often shades of gray. That's often what a karma, self-karma, and some of these things is. It's a, it's a range. So, not a single thing. And then many of you will recognize the five soul ages. Infant, I call it childhood here, uh, rather than baby soul, because I thought it needed to, many people use the word infant and baby interchangeably. Mm. Um, adolescence instead of young soul. Um, and I, I try to use these terms also to replicate a human life cycle. So not only are they viable for soul age questions, but they're also viable for like your internal monads or even the stage of life you're in. You know, people like me who are youthful. Uh, you know, for certain stages of my delusion uh, that are, you know, crawling up here near Elder. And I want to pretend they're still back here. Is there, is there some correlation, like let's say you're a certain soul age, of the, that the time of life you'll fully... Um, embody that soul age, like if let's say you're an infant soul, you'll probably come into your own when you're an infant, whereas when you're an elder soul, you have more life reviews, you might not come into your own until you're actually physically an elder. Is there like a correlation to this physical age? You mean relative to the cards, no, or you no, mean in general to the Michael system. teaching? Yeah, relative to the system. My experience in the system, so I'm answering now a Michael teaching's question, uh, just specifically as I know how, and as I understand it, Suzanne, um, that in in an infant soul period, every time we're born into a new body, we're essentially replicating that series of lessons once again. Um, however, a real infant soul is going to be stuck in a, in a very narrow um, set of confines of behaviors. Of, of uh, It's going to be fearful of everything. It's not going to have very any kind of... Very instinctive. Very instinctive, exactly. And so with each progressive... <coughs> Um, lifetime as we as we grow into an older soul age, our attitudes are uh, to some extent our intellect, uh, but there are some, some very 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 brilliant baby souls out there who know a lot of information, but it's information. It's not a sense of uh, that deeper experiential knowledge. Cohesion. There's no cohesion to it exactly. So um, the answer at a simple level is I believe yes. As one progresses through soul ages, they still are going to replicate through the times of their lives um, challenges or uh, attitudes um, of you know those uh, those earlier soul ages. But they're going to grow out of them faster, and they're going to progress to the next one. In the same way that I, I would wager every one of you here were probably. Even, even when you were teenagers and had your wild sides, of whatever way that played itself out, you probably all had more awareness as teenagers and looked around and go, wow, this seems really odd. <laughs> because your innate soul age was greater than your physical age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and how does this relate to grand cycles? I have this thought that maybe the grand cycles are a meta soul age. So, in other words, you may be an old soul, but remember that Earth has a average number of previous cycles of three or four, that puts it squarely in the infant soul grand cycle, uh -huh. which may be why the Earth is like kind of a savage, instinctive type of place. Can we talk about that during lunch? It would take, it'd take <laughs> yeah. us off on a, on a tangent that would take us quite a bit of time. It's great questions and they're very interesting, but it would, it would definitely take me off track. Mm -hmm. So, um, and by the way, at the upper left is the Tao card. Mm -hmm. The symbol is the Alpha and the Omega in the Book of Life. It's everything. And when you pull the Tao card, it is the most important card in the deck. It is the one that says, whether you get it right side up or upside down, 
you're getting that, that literally your whole universe around you is in a perfect state. Perfect for you where you're at. That's the key, where you're at. Not absolute perfect in some kind of magical sense. Down at the total other end of the spectrum, you have the Nexus card, which also is these two by themselves, they're, they're focused in orange because they're what's called the Tao set. And the Tao set is eternal change against eternal presence. Because both truths are true, isn't it? The universe is eternal, right? And it's constantly in flux. Realization and potential. Realization and potential. Absolutely. Okay. So that's so. If you ever need the chart, there's that. I I've mentioned the suits already. Um, I just wanted to cover these. The symbols. I mentioned sets earlier. These are the so this is the artisan set. You'll notice that the palette is in the upper left hand corner. Okay. Uh, but also, if you look. Uh, you'll see that we have a roll card, we have a goal card, uh, behind there is an attitude, and, and uh, we'll get into those next. So, palette is the uh, artisan, sage is the star, right? Huh? Come on, sages, be with me, right? Don't you love it? Okay. Warrior, I chose I chose the, the knight, uh, the horse, from um, uh, Western Game of Chess. I thought that was solid, you know, powerful, without being too overtly violent. The king, we're all our own sovereign, aren't we, ultimately? The crown, of course. The server, first responders, the ones who help. Okay? I, I love servers. I, I think, you know, I mean, without servers, our world wouldn't go around, even if they get the least amount of credit. They're the ones who do the work. Priest, you know, you have the eternal flame of mysticism in the palm there. I was hoping I could find this with uh, Leonard Nimoy's uh, Shin. Uh, For those of you who know that, uh, I heard a story from him. I was watching a video of him, and he was explaining where this came from. And this is actually uh, a sacred Hebrew symbol for the letter Shin. And the letter Shin in Hebrew is the feminine aspect of, uh, of God. And so it's a blessing. This is a blessing. It's not only really live long and prosper. But it is a blessing. Oh, cool. So when he gives it, that was good. And he said, I just loved it. And they let me do it. Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. loved Leonard yeah. DeMoy. It was great. Yeah. So he came up with it. Uh, he, yeah, he did. I mean, but he, had it, he came up with it because he saw it when he was in synagogue. Oh. And, he, and, and that would be the way that uh, they would be blessing the crowd. So He came up with it because he's spawn. Because he's spawn. Yeah. <laughs> he thought, he simply said, fascinating, Captain. <laughs> And then, of course, we have the, the atom for the scholar, okay? All right. Um, now, shift gears a little bit, what I'm calling groups. If ever you get two of a group in a reading, just like if ever you get two or more of the similar set, know that that quality is emphasized. So, in other words, if you got... Let's just go back a second here before I do this. If you got five artisan cards... In one of in a reading, say of like seven, folks, what do you think it's telling you? <laughs> something about your creativity, something about your level of invention, something about you know your exploration, right? In other words, artist-oriented messages. And but then the parts of the artisan that it would be conveying might be telling you the specifics where you need to look in. And if it were reversed, it may it may be saying, okay, you know, there's something more you need to do. That would be if you saw similar colors. If you saw similar group members. Now notice, these are all attitudes. And you can tell the attitudes. By the way, that is actually an, what's called an attitude meter for any of you who fly. That is the name of that uh, symbol. Um, so it's up here in the upper right-hand corner. Notice they're not up. But, but they're, notice they're all different colors because they're members of each different set. You see that? So we got the artisan attitude, the sage attitude, the warrior attitude, king attitude, and so on. Steve, if, yes. Yes, can I interrupt? Yes, again. One more chat for Peter was starting to tell me that there is this rose, and then now, like, and I think I think she was saying the attitude. But, so could, can you tell me more about so that I get the main picture, if you don't mind, real quick? What is that about groups? What does that mean, the groups? So if you're looking at this, yeah. Okay, a group. 
Look at the headings on the left side, and then travel across. In this case, go down to attitude, and travel across, to, across the row from left to right. What it's simply saying is, of this particular type of overleaf, the attitude, the attitude is defined of about how we mentally bring, or shall I say, intellectually um, how we intellectually uh, uh, adopt a position or a, a way of looking at a circumstance. That's what an attitude is in general. Well, there are seven different attitudes or seven different positions or seven different filters, you might say, or mental adaptations that we could use. And so, and these are those seven. Now, if in a reading, and now remember, I'm just using the group called attitudes, but this is true for any grouping. If you got, say, a five, a five card uh, a reading, which we'll go through right after lunch, the layouts. If you got one of those, and you got, say, two or three attitudes, it could be that, depending upon what poll they're in, they might be in conflict. It could be it's offering you a choice. Well, you, you could look at this pragmatically, or you could look at this idealistically. Or you could be stoic about something, etc., etc. Do you follow what I'm doing here? Yes. If this were modes, if this were modes, let's assume that we saw the little car. Our little car, why is a mode of the little car, anybody? How are you going to get there? How are you going to get there, exactly. It's your vehicle for transport, baby. So, the mode, if these were modes, of course, we'd have caution, we'd have power, we'd have perseverance, we'd have aggression, we'd have reservation, passion, and then observation. So, if we had those seven, and we had two or three come up, it would say, maybe, if your question was about a sequence, and you got, all of a sudden it says, oh, start off cautiously. Then, in your sequence, it says, oh, hit the gas, Go to passion. And then it might, and then might, if you had, say, observation at the end, it says, okay, so stand back and watch what happens. In each case, whenever you get um, similar characteristics, it's adding, what's the word I've been harping on all day? It adds a layer. layer. Right, it adds a layer of analysis if you care to probe it. Otherwise, remember, you can just look at the card, see how it, it affects you, and go from there. That's okay. You, there's no requirement from Michael or me or anyone that you take it anywhere except where your imagination and your curiosity seem to draw you. Okay, so the last kind of um, element of organization that's present in the cards are these things that I call clusters. And there are two clusters in this group. And again, at least one of them is represented pretty clearly on your uh, chart there. And the main one is a very powerful concept in this teaching called the exalted, and its contrasting part is expanded, or excuse me, is ordinal, pardon me. And you can notice the symbols that I've chosen, the pharaoh for exalted, you know, something very potent, widespread, uh, having a, a great deal of influence, and the penny for the ordinal. And I chose the penny because I thought, it, for me personally, ordinal, my experience of ordinality, which I actually have a, a fair bit of it, is personal. But even in the world, in the same way that I just complimented the, the fact that we need servers, you know, by themselves, people don't give much credence to a penny, do they? But by God, you have a million pennies, and you've got some power. Now, granted, it's quite an accumulation. It takes a while to get that, you know, get all that kind of energy. But nonetheless, it has, you know, a real potent effect. And then the second one is, um, you probably recognize the yin and yang. And of course, in this teaching, we, we call it masculine and feminine energy. And some, some channels call it uh, convergent and divergent energy. Susanna, are there any other dualities uh, for that concept that you're aware of? Expansion, absorption. It's expansion, absorption, okay. So, in any case, that's what uh, those symbols are, uh, are, are about. Okay. Now, next exercise. And for this one, uh, we're going to just quickly go through this for a couple minutes, and then I'm going to have you guys do it. <coughs> and we're going to do this together. 
Okay, so we're starting our group deconstruction. Time for unpacking. So what do you all first notice? What's all assimilation access. Excellent. All assimilation access. Okay, so you got yellow, yellow, yellow. Okay, what else? Anything? Spades. Pardon me? They're all, yeah, they're, they're all spades. Good, which is another way of indicating the assimilation access. That's good. So notice, by the way, sometimes I will have uh, a, a number of coinciding things that are indicating the same thing, uh, but may show up in different, uh, different contexts. Okay, what else? Well, you have the numbers there, like 21, then there's 42, so 2, 2 is 4, 1 and 1 is 2, and then I get uh, adding 2 to 4, you get 6. I don't know, the numbers seem to pop out of me, and then 2 and 2 is 4, 64. Okay. Uh, that's what I get. <coughs> uh, I, I didn't intend that, but if it has meaning for you, it may very well. What other, what other kinds of things? Yes. Rachel. I see an overarching theme of assimilation, and specifically that maybe it's about listening to, to your instinctually practical nature, something like that. Whoa! How does that feel when you hear that as just one interpretation? That's, that's, that's got some substance, doesn't it? Now, which, what, uh, what Rachel intuitively did was something I was just going to go to, so thank you, is look at the order in the layout. She literally followed them from left to right the way that we do uh, in the English language. Okay. Now, if I ask you hypothetically, what if we move this order around? Do you think it might change the message? Mm -hmm. Being pragmatic mm -hmm. and recognizing your instincts brings you to greater assimilation. If you read from right to left. It's a different meaning, isn't it? Yeah. And but no, pardon me, but related, certainly, yes, certainly related. But it, and so the the kind of variations on messages that you can get can be subtle, uh, just by the placement of cards. Now, one that I didn't hear anyone say is notice they're all, they're all in the upright position, the illuminated or positive poles. When I see all the cards in a layout in the same position. In this case, illuminated, and I call it I call negative poles in this teaching the shadow poles, in the Jungian sense, <laughs> for a lot of different reasons. But for right now, if I see cards all in the same position, I have information both in the booklet and I'm sorry I did it again. I got to give you guys these before you go. Um, in your handout, uh, which I'm not following all that much, but it has all this stuff as reminders. It simply says that this would suggest open and go. Okay, Positive would, you know, it would be expansionary, open, go, move forward. If they were all negative, they would suggest that it was contractive, stay put, um, take a step back, something like that. All right, so we, you know, so I'm just going through this now. Okay, notice that I, I mentioned the card order. Um, I suggest that you check for positive and negative poles. Um, you look for set similarity, which Rachel pointed out immediately. Okay, and then uh, whatever group membership it might be in. And in this particular case, this is an axis card, and so if you were to look at your chart, you'll notice that. These two are what we would call scholar cards, scholar set. But an axis card is more inclusive than that. I was a little lazy. I just said, all right, unlike the other cards, I'm going to just use the same coloration. But nonetheless, they all carry that, that uh, unique assimilative axis energy. And then for those of you who know your Michael teaching... You can go in and start and read, say, well, what is it about the assimilative axis? And what if you happen to be a scholar? And what if you happen to be a scholar? In which case, that message is going to probably be even more impactful or significant to you. So what we're going to do now is you're going to all get a chance to do a three-card spread. And what I'd like you to do is, are you any of you willing to switch seats with somebody? Any of you? Sure. Maybe? Okay. So what I'd like you to do there is grab your deck, for those of you who are willing to move, and maybe just to make it easy, both members of a pair who worked together before, you got just one of you move, 
and then you guys switch around. Would you do that? So, and what I'd like you to do is one of you choose who's going to be the reader, and then choose who's going to be the red. You have a, you have a, oh, I don't I don't need to understand. Are you ready? Okay. All right. So, one is going to be the reader. You use your own deck. Because I came in late. Okay. And you will instruct uh, the person that you're reading for how to shuffle it in whatever way you see. So, it could be shuffling your files. You could be handing the deck to be its lots. Or just even tapping. That's completely legit, yeah, too. You, you, Did everyone hear that? No. Okay, so if you give me your attention, please. Has everyone determined who is going to be the reader and who is going to be the one who's read for? Okay, somebody say yes. 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 Good. So, reader, you're going to use your decks. So, the one who's going to be read for, just set your deck to the side. Okay? All right, so... The first thing that you're going to do as the reader, this is you're, you're exercising your, your, your reader muscles. And here's your first choice. How do you want the person you're reading for to interact with your cards? Do you want them to shuffle them? Do you want to have them make stacks and you just restack them? In some cases, I went to a reader once who just said, tap them. And all, that's all I did was I just tapped the deck. So just notice whatever works for you. But make it quick, and then once that once the person you're reading for has touched your cards in some way, you're going to draw three of them. You're going to draw three of them. The reader is going to draw three of them. Uh, excuse me, the, the one who's getting a reading is going to draw three cards out of it. And what I'm suggesting to you right now is when you draw those cards, folks, have some kind of a general question in mind, a general idea in mind when you select those cards. Okay. <laughs> and then, okay, good. So go ahead and start from there. So he is, I guess, he is a <laughs> so he is, uh, radiologist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what this was. You know, I mean, I have So maybe, yeah, right now it's all about you. Okay? What did you react to? But so it's hard to go about me and talk to me about what you're doing, right? Because I always find the way to do it. Into a relationship for me. So, how long have you been in the and I've lost my Wow, real so Oh, I to get Me too, buddy. Me too, yeah. I mean, my secondary Saturday. Yeah, my secondary is too. I'm primary Joe Yeah, it's over. It's over. It's over. It's yeah. Um, you know what that picture is from? That's from the concentration camps in Germany. Star. Absolutely. You know, absolutely amazing. Very amazing. Can we supposed to be changing? So if you haven't changed, if you haven't changed, go ahead and change sides. Right. Uh, protractor. Protractor. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's kind of a uh, graphic artist kind of thing. Uh, no, mathematician. Oh, yeah. mathematician. In the old ways. <laughs> so change sides. Whoever was the reader before now becomes the readie. So when you feel a, a, come to a conclusion for the first person, and then swap sides. And now you also swap decks. Remember, your reader, you use your deck. With the person who is uh, you who you're reading for. Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you.
<laughs> All right, everyone, bring it to a close. Another eight. All right, let's bring it to a close. All right. So, thank you, everyone, for participating. I hope you all had a little fun with that. Anyone have any uh, comments, observations, experiences they'd like to share? Oh, okay. Oh, that was great. Well, so, two cards. So I went to pick a card, and two cards came out. I went to pick another card, and another two cards came out. So I went with four. They were all positive. They were just kind of like totally like it was totally an affirmation of my question. And the final final card was verification. And, and the spiritualist. But each one was like the server, the artisan. Tranquility came up again for the time today. Mm-hmm. And they all had they all had ordinal, they were all like money and she kinda like came up with like um, it all bringing together and tranquility through through financial abundance, which has been stopped for me. So it's just and it's just really beautiful. It's just very uplifting. And she did a great job. Cool. Yeah. All right, way to go. Esperanza. Yay. Yay. You said you wanted to know how to read, baby. You did it. You did it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. Well, you want to you uh, share next, Thomas? Yeah. Uh, I picked um, Nexus the, card. the Nexus card, uh, and then uh, Mirror, and then Inoculation, Simulation. Inoculation. Uh, it's inculcation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the inoculation. Like the yeah, really, exactly. So, he's, yeah, he's inoculating yourself against S's twins. <laughs> yeah, don't want to do that again. That's exactly right. <laughs> no. Uh, just just uh, the uh, uh, the Nexus, actually, Nexus, the Alpha and Omega had them three different cards that had each one of them in them. Each, each of those, uh, and uh, I just felt seren- this was a serendipity moment for me that realizing that I'm coming to an end of my the life I've been leading, and I'm looking at I've seen great abundance on on not only the physical level but the spiritual level, and and uh, mirroring this that uh, this mirrors uh, my life uh, so much, and then. The uh, inoculation. <laughs> That's assimilation. <laughs> Part of it. And the numbers then jumped out on me 64 again. Um, Delilah had 64. 64 next to Brandon Lee, too. And uh, the 6 and 4 in numerology adds up to 10, uh, which is 1, and it's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. And see, so because you're side to side, there's none of those questions of orientation and, and whose perspective is the positive and whose perspective is the negative. Right. That's an interesting thing yeah. that Susanna, uh, Susanna brings up because in the uh, uh, readings between she and Rachel, because they're sitting up, uh, you know, up opposite each other, when the cards were <coughs> split, they, they had to you know come to terms with. So, who one person's looking at the positive or illuminated side, the other person's looking at the shadow or negative side. So, in which case, what do you select? And Susanna, in her own inimical fashion, came up with a solution. She turned them to the side. And uh, so, you're there with, she, she created the, uh, you know, unifying orientation in the reading, as the reader. So, you anyone know, else? I, I noticed something. When I look at your cards from here, Thomas, it doesn't look like inoculation. It looks like intoxicated. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean, Steve? Don't go there. Oh, I'm not going there. Okay, next. Uh, anyone else have any comments or things that they noticed or what they would like to share about the process? Um, Rachel. I, I think it would take practice for me to learn how to read for other people because it felt like I was, in hindsight, really reading for myself. What I was saying was very applicable to myself and perhaps not applicable to the person I was reading for. But it was still interesting. She, um, she gave her own interpretation, which was fun, and, and I really enjoyed the reading I got. It was really good. 
Well, you know what? What's a good idea when you're reading for somebody else mm -hmm. is you just kind of connect like a line of green energy between your heart chakra and theirs. Mm -hmm. and that way, you know, it's actually kind of emerged for both of you. It might show reflections of you, and it might show reflections of them, but you both recognize that in the other. Mm -hmm. See, That's so okay. so that could be a good way to get like more on it and be able to also pick up insight as to what's going on with them and how the cards might relate to them. But yeah. you're picking into your intuition, just a thought. And you're going to get other chances today, too. That's yeah. good to know. Mm -hmm. Got to practice. Yeah. And Susanna, I like that. And then afterwards, to make sure you don't get the other person energy, what do you do? When you do a heart link, um, it's not like a cord. You're not sucking energy okay. from each other. It's just a way that they link. You could hold that forever. You could just sever it when you're done. If you're going to be working with a line of people, you want to disconnect and reconnect to the person you're working with. Otherwise, you're still reading for that other person. And how, but how since would you're not cording, you're not taking energy away. It's just like a, it's just like a little link between you. Okay. Okay. So you're not taking on their energy. You're just kind of mm. touching them. See, mm. it's not the same. Good. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Yes. So Caleb. Sarah and I shared a, yeah, a similar, the same card in the same position, uh -huh. the same pull up. So talking mm. about that heart connection, that's the Scary. first thing. <laughs> That I, it was a powerful part for yes. all time. Yeah. Um, feeling that connection and like that synergy you're talking about again. Mm -hmm. So, really, really cool. Why did you say it was a scary? You thought oh. the best card was? Our, our oh, initial boy. reaction wow. was the boy, the, the unknown. Oh, the I always boy. react to the negative Possibly. hole with an oh no, and then I look at a big black hole, and, and that was her initial reaction when she first turned it over. <gasps> it's the event horizon. Event horizon, which is what our questions Point were past, about. which no light. I like that event horizon. Also, it might be helpful because what we did, sword? we didn't you share with each other what we were asking the cards when we cut them. Oh. In traditional divination readings, the reader will verbalize to the reader their question, and it does make it a bit easier to interpret and right. that makes yeah, it a way that makes true. sense for them. That's true. She and I didn't do that. We just cut the cards. What do you read? Well, that's a kind of a, that's kind of a cold reading. It's so. pretty Rorschachy, like exactly. you spill your guts right. on the table. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's usually good if you're reading, I think, to ask them to verbalize that question. That way, you can make it have a little more context. For them. And, that's and if you think that the question is like way too vague, you might direct it, well, specifically, or something like that, you know. Exactly, that's exactly. Good. Oh, that's good. So, good, good. How was so that fun? you did great, considering yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good. Yes. You like that? I didn't tell you what I was asking. Okay, so, what we're going to do yeah, now, then, is I'm going to, uh, it's 1235, and, uh, and we're going to take lunch. Great, so thank you for that, and uh, because of your phrasing, the universe has even popped up a few little options, even in this room. Oh. Yeah, I know, pretty amazing. Thank you for womanifesting for me. <laughs> okay, Thanks so. Thanks for mansplaining. Mansplaining. <laughs> cool. I do love that phrase. <laughs> All right, so reading for, reading for other people. There's Brutus. Yeah, my dog didn't like mine. And uh, <laughs> Brutus, is, as you can see, is really contemplating the nature of the cards. You know, uh, Brutus is really, uh, he wants to have, you know, a real meaningful conversation with the person that he's, uh, he's going to read for. And remember, that's the whole point of these cards, you know, is uh, about having a conversation. So when you're having that conversation, some of you already started doing this. You know, this is the explanation after you already experienced it. Some of you find yourself being able to ask really probing questions, and the person will go, oh, yeah, that's right, good, oh, yeah, thanks, I didn't think about that. Which means you are helping them to get gotten. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, when you're doing a reading with someone, uh, when they get gotten, the next gift that you can provide somebody is to witness what happens for them. It's to witness when emotions have been moved. Mm. And sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's very overt. Sometimes they can be absolutely joyful emotions, other times they might be very pained ones. But at those moments, if you can allow them, you allow yourself to be with that person and to let them outflow, then a simple card reading can become something much more uh, deep and meaningful. 
And the thing for us that always amazes me is that when I'm in the presence of somebody who is in deep process and who is allowing me to be there with them, it's, it's pretty moving for me uh, to be able to witness them and to be able to experience myself. It's just going, wow, you know, this is, this is what humanity is. This is what vulnerability is. This is what it's like to have a shared mm-hmm. human experience or a shared human dilemma sometimes. So, readings that for other people usually involve the kind of questions we have to ask. And the, uh, the wheel here is just an example of the many, play, the many, many, many uh, domains of human experience. Uh, and by the way, the numbering of the order isn't in any particular uh, specific form, but just look at it. I mean, whether your personal spiritual development, what do you, you know, people you're interacting with, your neighbors in the community. Uh, I've had people literally spend a whole hour asking me about political questions, you know, so we got civic yeah. affairs and uh, <laughs> health and diet. Uh, that's, you know, that's, of course, Susanna's bailiwick in, in many ways. Uh, uh, fitness and exercise, our friend Satya New Day, uh, just as an example, but all these different things vocation, your education, home environment, workplace environment. Uh, your financial security, your debt situation, how much money you make, all these are potential areas to be able to probe and, and originate questions from. My favorite.